Okay, students, welcome to 13.1.2 and the road to the Civil War. We're going to talk a little bit about sectional disagreements over import tariffs. So we're going to talk a little bit more about tariffs again. So let's go ahead and jump right on in here today. And again, we'll try to make this a short one for you. Okay, so when we talk about politics and looking at sectionalism and problems facing the North and the South, many times it's driven by, again, the sectionalist political ideas coming from the North and the South. And so people play political games that often get it, people into trouble and create uh, problems for other people throughout the country. In this case, one of the things that happened was is that John Quincy Adams had some political enemies that didn't want to see him reelected. So one of the things that they did is they create this tariff bill that was going to severely impact southern farmers and benefit northern industrialists. And so when they looked at this tariff, they thought to themselves, if we can get it passed and then have John Quincy Adams veto it, then it'll make him look like he is not fighting for northern manufacturers. So their whole goal was to actually have this law vetoed. It wasn't passed in order to have it actually go into effect. The people who pushed it forward really wanted it just to really hamper John Quincy Adams. However, one of the things that we had to understand that is different from that era to our era is when presidents used vetoes. Often, presidents wouldn't veto something unless they saw that it was really blatantly anti-constitutional or if it was really uh, politically damaging uh, but the veto was not used frequently um, and John Quincy Adams looked at the bill he said I don't see anything wrong with this I don't see anything slightly unconstitutional about it I'll go ahead and sign it so he signs it and the tariff bill becomes law and the other thing though that Adams understood too is that by signing this Tra this tariff into law, yes, it would have been able to help northern manufacturers who often were part of his base, but more than anything, it helped Andrew Jackson be propelled into the presidency. So that's what happens here is that John Quincy Adams is un understands that at this point his political career is over and that Jackson's going to win because of this tariff law. I'm not quite sure what his full rationale behind that was, but uh, it, it is something that is an interesting political debate and discussion about it that requires a lot more in-depth study in order to kind of see Adam's thought process here. At the same time, though, Jackson already was pushing towards the popular vote and getting himself in a position to be elected next time, too. And... All in all, Adams had created some political enemies as it stood. So there's probably a good chance that Adams, even if he hadn't assigned this bill, he probably would have been defeated anyways. So this tariff is passed, though, and it is given a name by Southern farmers, and that is called the Tariff of the Abominations. Basically, it is the worst, most awful, terrible tariff bill that could have ever been passed in the eyes of southern plantation owners. It does a number of things that really hurts them economically from a number of fronts. So they label this bill, uh, this tariff so, um, so rightfully so in their view <laughs> as an abomination against them uh, that they, they, they slap this title on it and we still know about it to this day because of how much of a role it plays in creating a constitutional crisis. So what are we looking at here? Well, one thing is that these tariffs were designed to really protect go uh, northern goods, okay? Um, pretty much things that were coming over from England that directly competed with American products. They were tariffed to higher levels to prevent them from overwhelming the American market. Often this was in the form of like woolen goods. Um, also, some machined items would come over, too, but a lot of it's uh, attacking American textiles and such, too. Um, one of the things, though, it does is because 
we're trying to promote American products at this time and we're trying to keep English products out, it forces those English products to raise their prices for the manufactured goods. If you guys remember, we've talked about this, but the South would send its cotton to England for their textile manufacturing. The South would then use the money that they are making on that initial sale and buy English manufactured goods and have them brought back to the South. And it's it, because the ships were going to come back around anyways, it, it seemed like a logical approach for the South. What this does, though, is it raises the prices on everything the South wants to buy from England. So they're not typically buying things from the northern manufacturers, but if they are, so say even they're looking at going, all right, well, you know what? Fine, raise the price on the English stuff. I'll buy American. And because American manufacturing is still fairly in its infant stage, it is often not producing enough goods to meet the entire demands of the nation. So not only are they looking now at higher priced English goods, they're looking at higher priced American goods because if you understand supply and demand, you understand price fluctuation and how that, uh, that affects pricing of certain goods. Um, and so the South is facing kind of a double barrel situation of high prices coming from England, high prices in the United States. So they're just suffering economically and no matter what they are trying to do in order to get manufactured goods. Another thing is though is that it starts to lower the demand for southern cotton because if they're not selling their manufactured products to America, they don't need to produce as much. So if they're not going to produce as much, they're not going to buy the southern cotton. So this impacts them financially from their standpoint of how they are profitable and how they make money. So as you can see, there's lots of things starting to stack on top of each other that really start to put pressure down on the southern plantations uh, and southern farmers. This isn't just plantation owners. You have small-time farmers that are still operating in this area too. So while the south is facing economic problems now, um, they're paying a lot for manufactured products and goods, the north on the other hand, they're doing just fine. They have the manufacturing capabilities and capacities. They're the ones making profit on their manufactured goods going to the west, to the north, and also to the south. So all in all, this entire tariff of abominations looks like it's a net positive for the North, and the South is upset about that. They're going, why is it that one part of the country should benefit while the other part of the country suffers? They look at it and they go, this is unfair to the point that it should be unconstitutional because it's only impacting one part of the country and putting a burden on one part of the country. They're going, you know, laws, if they're coming from the federal government, should be equally applied. So this creates a new idea that comes out um, in the sense of what can states do to attack laws that they find unfair. And they come up with this idea of nullification. Um, John C. Calhoun, who, interestingly enough, initially supported and advocated uh, for the tariffs, again, he's looking to hurt John Quincy Adams during that time. Um, he now becomes the champion against the tariffs. And he does wield political power because he is uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, vice president. So people see that he does have the ability to have a national platform into which they can promote these ideas. So what they look at is Calhoun goes down to South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina is one that's really suffering with it. A lot of this is really based around what happens in South Carolina too. And he says, look, these are hurting us. We need to do something to stop it. So we have the right, we have the right, as he says, to just say we're not going to follow the law because it's unconstitutional. We have a right as a state because the state gives the federal government power. We have the right as a state to also use that same power to push back against federal laws that we find are unfairly applied or are unconstitutional in our view. This creates a nullification crisis. So what it does is it creates a, a problem within the Constitution. If a southern state like South Carolina can nullify this law, what prevents all other states from being able to nullify whatever federal law they disagree with? Remember, the Constitution is supposed to be the supreme law of the land. So on that front, too, federal laws are supposed to supersede state laws. If a state can just 
nullify a federal law, then what power does the federal government have anymore to apply laws across the country? So South Carolina is the one that really pushes this idea forward. And they state, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to pay the, ta- we're not going to charge the tariffs. We're not going to collect tariff duties. What are you going to do, federal government? And so again, you're looking at this from a perspective where the federal government has to either act or sit back and have the Constitution be reinterpreted by a state. The other thing they look at, too, is if you guys remember when we're studying the Constitution, you can look at the Tenth Amendment where they talk about if things are not expressly written in the Constitution, then the state or the people have the right themselves to look at, interpret, and make laws based around it. This is kind of one of the other arguments that they're trying to use this. Look at the Tenth Amendment. This says we can do it, so it's I vote against it saying it's unconstitutional. However, at the same time, the right to practice tariffing and gain money that way is also a federal right too. So, as you can see, it's creating conflict in that front. And so what does Andrew Jackson do? Well, he comes down and he, he goes, um, well, all right, one other thing before I go to Jackson. One other thing, though, to really focus in on at this point, too. Nullification goes further than just the fight over tariffs, okay? So this is, again, they're pushing this idea of a state right. So if somebody does something in the federal government that they don't agree with, that they can fight back and push back against it. The other part of nullification that is a key critical reason why we study it is that the South realized that they were starting to lose political power due to mass immigration to the North and also higher birth rates and industrialization. When you have large spread out plantations that take up vast areas of the countryside, you're typically in an agrarian society, you don't have rapid population growth. In an industrialized northern area, yes, you do have rapid population growth. So pretty soon it's going to just be a matter of time before the north wields enough power to use the abolitionist movement and eventually outlaw slavery. Um, As I always talk about when we're going through the study of history and when certain things are not covered but they're extremely important, I like to talk about them too. And this goes back again to the Second Great Awakening you guys remember us talking about that and that's the second american religious revival and during this time with the second american religious revival it opens up this new idea that pushes out mostly the predestination ideas of calvinists and instead pushes more towards those evangelical ideas of every person has the ability to be saved by the grace of god you know this is this is ideas that they're pursuing and pushing out there. And they start to come up with this idea of saying, see, look, since we're not all preordained, we all have the ability to be enriched by these teachings. And so they start pushing this idea that, yes, the southern slaves have that same right. So there is a political and religious bent to the abolitionist movement. You guys need to understand that that is a very important part of it. Um, Typically, we don't always cover that in American history, but I like to bring it out there so you guys can see that there's other elements in play when these decisions and these arguments and these debates are happening in American history. Just understand that's all I'm trying to do is bring you that extra element here. Um, But it is a critical element, too, and one that cannot be ignored. So make sure that you, if you guys decide to study this further, that those are additional uh, factors you take into account, okay? Anyways, going back to the state's laws and more power from the North, eventually the South realized that with this hardcore abolitionist movement starting to be uh, generated up in the North, and as more Western states are starting to come in and not agree with slavery too, that eventually it's just a matter of time before slavery would be outlawed. And so, again, this idea of nullification and, quote-unquote, states' rights would be their way to be able to protect their rights to own slaves. That's why they push so hard for this nullification idea to pass, is to protect their right to slavery. Um, one of your one of the other history teachers, she always says they talk about the South and they're pushing for states' rights and always shout back, state right to do what? State right to do what? It's the state right to keep slavery. That's always one thing that people need to understand. That's the ultimate idea, state rights and nullifications leading up to the Civil War. All right, so what happens finally? Well, there's two things 
that um, Andrew Jackson does to try to prevent this from becoming a full-fledged um, constitutional issue and uh, basically a, a something that tears the country apart. First and foremost, he sends troops to South Carolina to enforce the tariffs and force them to collect those duties. And he does so under the threat of federal power. Remember, when we talked about constitutional law and what people's ro role is within the Constitution. With the president, he has the power to enforce the law. And Jackson does just that with military power. Um, the other thing, though, is, is before he goes off and just looks like he's a tyrant and going down there to seize power and control, he gets authorization from Congress to send down the troops to collect these tariffs. So he makes sure he acts legally, too. The other thing is, is that he works with Henry Clay in order to pass a compromise tariff bill that reduces the overburden on the southern plantation owners. So all, all in all, the nullification crisis, the crisis itself, ends with compromise. However, this starts to plant the seeds of secessionist movements, um, plants the seeds of nullification, and starts to put this... Uh, South Carolina, I mean, is the very first one that's really starting to talk about we're going to leave the country if we can't get away with this. So it plants those little seeds that eventually grow into full-on rebellion against the federal government. All right, guys, that does it for this unit. Um, go ahead and make sure you do your homework, and I will see you again on Monday. So make sure you have a great weekend.